welcome to Palace Confidential. It's your weekly look at all things royal, brought to you right here from Mail Plus. I'm Jo Elvin, and we'll start by heading straight to our panel this week. And joining me is the Daily Mail's consultant editor, Andrew Pearce, and the diary editor, Richard Eden. Welcome to you both. We all got the pink memo. <laughs> Pleased to see it. Um, Make boys wink. <laughs> well, that's what we're hoping for. But, Andrew, I'm going to start with you in the story about Meghan this week, that Pearl, her big project at Netflix, has been dumped, apparently. Um, were you surprised by this? No. And I have to tell you, I was secretly, not even thrilled, secretly, thrilled, thrilled <laughs> to a bit, because as you know, I'm not a fan of Meghan's. And Netflix have clearly worked out that if you do woke, you go broke, because it's all about Pearl on a voyage of discovery, going back in time, meeting all these female icons. It's apparently educational and inspirational. And we also know it would have been boring yeah. and preachy. But is, what does it say about the fall from grace of Meghan Markle? This contract was signed, what, 2020? We're not even, it's not even two years old, and they've realised already her celebrity is fading in the United States. She's only got celebrity because she's married into the British royal family. Uh, we know but Harry, every time Harry opens his mouth, he puts another wedge between him and the House of Windsor, his own family. The fact he's not going to be at the Jubilee this summer will mean, again, he's remote and disconnected. And I think Netflix are working out. They're not the investment they thought they were. But mm. it's it's just this one project, right? Yeah, They've but that still was a got... big one. That was yeah. a pretty big project. And it was very important to Me Meghan herself, who's the great um, woke warrior queen. She, wants, she wanted to take young girls with her on this voyage. And, and it's a real blow to her prestige and her ego and it was her project i think she'd even written the script mm. that's a pity that we won't get to see that because if it was anything like as bad as because if it was anything like as bad as that book which uh, she wrote it would have been quite entertaining mm. for oh all the wrong goodness. reasons i mean my daughter is um, obsessed with the marvel universe so i'm not sure how pearl would have gone down with her but <laughs> richard what do you think this does mean for harry and meghan's future as content creators I think it's a real problem. I think they fancied themselves as, as producers and they, they hoped this would be the first of many, many programmes. Um, but they don't have the background in it or the experience. And um, what's so significant, I think, and what's frankly worrying is I think the only projects that will get the green mm. light from Netflix now will be very personal ones about yeah. the royal family. So look, the only current project they have is about the Invictus Games, which is a very worthy cause, but it's all about Harry. And we saw how Meghan sort of muscled in on that. She, she went to the Invictus Games in the Netherlands and gave a speech, even though she has no formal role with Invictus. And I think any future project will have to be similarly personal. So, you know, it could be how Prince Harry's coped with grief after the death of his mother or something to tie in, something Not to tie again. in with his um, memoirs. But it will have to be personal and it will have to involve the royal family. And that puts them in an awkward position because I don't think they wanted to do that. And certainly it will make people nervous back at Buckingham Palace. Do they, do they actually really need to have this deal with Netflix? Are they in a position where they need to earn money? I always just see them as these fabulously rich people who, you know, whether something fails or not, is it's fine. Of course you want, they want to earn more money, but um, the, they also want to, be, they want to be loved. Remember they went to the United States so they could be ordinary private citizens and then they immediately sign a deal with the biggest streaming agency in the world, Netflix, mm. because that's what you do if you want to be an ordinary private citizen. Uh, they, they crave public profile, prestige, publicity, uh, and, uh, and Netflix was the great way to do that. And I think there'll be more, I think Richard's right, there'll be more setbacks. They'll turn into what Prince Edward, you remember his ill-fated film company, Ardent Productions, it was anything but Ardent. And in the end, I, I, all I he was I do remember, doing, it's a royal knockout. Exactly. <laughs> and all in the end it did, it made a series of really boring programmes about the royal family, and in the end it was canned. And uh, Meghan and Harry have only one narrative now for Harry to talk about, Princess Diana, of course, he could talk about his mother, of course, and he'll talk about that a lot, but even that's going to fade. And, uh, and she can keep banging on about how um, awful it was being in the British royal family. Well, they've stepped aside now, and Netflix have realised where, where the dollar signs are, not with them. But rem remember that um, Prince Harry said explicitly in his interview with Oprah Winfrey that they only signed the deals with Spotify and with Netflix because he'd been cut off by his family. So he was saying, we need the money. I mean, yes, since then, they've got some other deals for things like Better Up. But he, he made clear they needed to do that sort of deal. So mm. it, it does 
make me wonder about what the future holds. Oh, they don't good. have to live in a house with nine bathrooms, you know. Well, they could live in somewhere a little more I modest. I have made that point before. Mm. It's like, you know, why do we need millions and millions and millions? But hey, who am I to judge? But it's not the only criticism this week, is it, Andrew? There's Tina Brown's new book about the royals includes a claim that Meghan doesn't have, quote unquote, Diana's work ethic. Do you think that's fair? I do. I do. Because Diana worked ceaselessly and tirelessly. And we discovered also after she died, the extraordinary work she did behind the scenes that never got any publicity, the remarkable work she did about making HIV um, almost acceptable in the public eye. It was very important for me as a gay man who campaigned for Stonewall mm. and equal rights. Uh, she was remarkable in many ways, Diana, and she was patron of so many charities. What does Megan do? Not much. She's in fact patron of a, an animal charity where I got my two moggies from. She's never set foot in it. Not that we're missing her. We're managing quite well without her. But do you think, could, could this question of the work ethic, could that be behind this Pearl news that she just basically hasn't done anything on it yet? Yeah. Well, I think they were always going to be sort of supervising. They envisaged themselves as kind of entertainment moguls who would be commissioning other people, and they started recruiting. But it's a big thing. I mean, look at this programme. You know, the effort that we put into producing this programme each week, it takes serious effort and organisation. And they started recruiting people, but Netflix didn't want to put that network of people behind them. They thought... I mean, it would be embarrassing, wouldn't it, for Netflix if they brought it out and it was a flop. They can't afford that now. They're struggling, they're losing subscribers, you know, since the pandemic, and they need to bank on popular shows. But the Sussexes don't really engage with the British media, as we know, in certain sections of it. But Tina Brown... But they read it avidly. They do read it avidly, but Tina Brown's part of the American mm. media establishment. Do you think then having her giving that voice to all of these criticisms will sting the Sussex. Oh, that will really wound because she's a huge figure in the United States. So she's had great literary success, magazine success yeah. in America. And uh, and she chooses her words very carefully, Tina Brown. She wasn't personal, but she did make the point that she hasn't got the work ethic. What does she do all week? Rattling around that enormous house, planning to save the world, planning to save w women from awful men. Uh, well, there's the chickens. I imagine they take a lot of work. Must do. But Richard, you too had a story about the latest development in Meghan's trademark battles. Well, this could be another way that they'll see their, see some new income. Um, before she got engaged to Prince Harry, she had a lifestyle um, blog called The Tig, and it was clearly inspired by um, Gwyneth Paltrow and Goop. And it was, it, it was kind of her different interests, whether it was wine or holidays, this sort of thing. Anyway, she wasn't allowed to do that once she married into the royal family. But it looked like she was interested in doing that again because she applied to reactivate the trademark for The Tig. That was last November, I think. Well, anyway, the story this week is um, she's been told that, sorry, it's not happening because there's one failing with your application. You forgot to sign it. <laughs> um, that sounds completely made up. Yeah, that can't no, be true. No, it was a fact. She, she yeah. forgot to sign it. No one signed it. So they've rejected it. And they say, come back to us in six months. But we won't look at this for Why six months. Why can't you just sign it? And do you really, why, do, why does that have to be six months? I mean, it's know? bizarre, isn't it? They must yeah. employ lawyers or people who would know how to fill in a form. So I can't understand, unless there's some kind of... That just seems very unlucky to She me. probably yeah. delegated staff to do all of it. Yeah. Don't, don't bring me detail, don't bring me detail, and get the form in the post. And uh, they forgot to sign But that is an extraordinary omission. It shows she's not a businesswoman as well, because Presumably someone you have will to be sign everything. Soon. Yeah. yeah, someone will be fired for that. Hmm. Good story, me. Richard. <laughs> yeah, fascinating. But let's turn to the week's other royal news now. And for that, we'll need the Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English. Rebecca, you were at a very fashionable event with the Duchess of Cambridge last night. How was she received? I was, although goodness knows what they were doing letting me into a fashion event, but I was with the Duchess of Cambridge last night and she was at a, a do organised by the British Fashion Council. Uh, she was there to present the Queen Elizabeth II Award for Design. Now this was set up five years ago to mark the outstanding contribution that the British fashion industry makes to this country. I mean it's a, a billion uh, pound industry uh, that I think employs well over a million people from both high 
street to high-end fashion. So it's an important part of um, this country's industry, and this award marks it. And actually, I was there five years ago when the award was launched, where we had this incredible moment, and hopefully you might have some footage of it, when actually the Queen sat in the fro, the front row, next to the legendary Anna Winter for a fashion show. It was probably one of the most remarkable uh, moments, I think, in my career of covering the Royals. And yesterday it was the Duchess of Cambridge's turn to present the award to a really popular and talented up-and-coming designer called Saul Nash. Um, she also watched an immersive fashion show. Uh, Saul Nash is known for his leisure wear designs and actually doesn't tend to employ models, tends to employ fellow dancers that he knows. Um, so there was this wonderful immersive fashion show. Uh, the thing that really struck me actually was how uh, even amongst, uh, you know, a group of models, you know, these swan-like proportions, uh, the Duchess of Cambridge still towered over most of them in her heels. But it was a great event and uh, publicising uh, a really important industry in this country. But it's not all high-end stuff with the Royals, is it? Camilla was sticking to the bargain basement end of things this week, wasn't she? Yeah, so this is what I love about this job, is you never know where you're going to be, who you're going to be speaking to, or what you're going to be doing from one day to the next. So on Tuesday, I was with the Duchess of Cornwall. I travelled up to Manchester with her to cover an engagement. She was there in her role as patron of Emmaus UK, which is an amazing charity which helps the homeless, and also patron of the Big Lunch. And this year, they're encouraging people over the Jubilee weekend to hold big jubilee lunches you know celebrating uh, the queen's historic 70 years on the throne uh, by sharing a meal with your your neighbors and what i loved is um, camilla uh, and i were walking around uh, the emmaus charity shop and uh, she kind of showed me a teapot, which she said, oh, you know, do, do you know anyone that collects these? You can get some great bargains here. And then she zoned in on this silver jubilee mug that was made to obviously commemorate the Queen's uh, uh, 25 years on the throne in 1977 and then she turned around and said basically I collect these believe it or not which really made me smile because uh, not only was she picking up a £1.50 charity shop mug for her collection but you know her face will be on the mugs one day as Queen Consul and yet she has a kind of the kind of hobby that I think millions of people up and down the country do as well collecting uh, royal memorabilia. And to the Queen now, where there were reports that the Royal Balcony is still up in the air and Her Majesty's plans to win the Derby hit a bit of a snag? Yes, I know. Although the Jubilee has been many years in the planning, there is still some really strong aspects of uncertainty about it, particularly who we're going to see and when. Um, you know, it... it the Queen is not going to be tending everything, and it's been suggested that she might not even be on the balcony at Buckingham Palace, although personally, and this is not based on any intelligence, I think they will try to get her. Uh, on the balcony at some point over the weekend because they know the public will want to see her and obviously that is the most visible way of doing it. Um, but yes, of course, we still have no confirmation whether Prince Andrew is going to be there at certain events, Prince Harry and his family. Um, I do actually have a briefing with uh, Buckingham Palace imminently over uh, Jubilee plans. Maybe we'll get some clarity then, but uh, I'm not sure I'd uh, put any money on that. The one thing we do know, and this is actually really sad news, is that the Queen will not have any riders now in the Epsom Derby, which is one of the key events of the Jubilee weekend. Um, it's the only one of the five flat classics she's never won and as, a, as a horse racer and owner. And uh, I think a lot of people were really hoping that there would be a fairy tale ending and that she would finally win the Derby in this her Platinum Jubilee year. But sadly, it is not to be. And now this is sort of like feels like a bit royal right move. Um, you had an update on where the Cambridges might move to and how they might be gazumping Prince Andrew. Yes, a little bit more on this uh, planned move to Berkshire uh, by the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, which has not been confirmed by Kensington Palace, but trust me, all of us royal correspondents know exactly what's going on. Um, and yes, it has been suggested before, I think actually by my colleagues on the Mail on Sunday, that they had been looking at a place called Adelaide Cottage, which is on the grounds of the Queen, it was a Windsor estate. That raised its head again at the weekend with uh, suggestions and reports that actually that was kind of moving up the pecking order and was one of their more favoured options. Um, I've been told by contacts that that could be a little bit tricky because 
Prince Andrew has actually always had his eye on that property. Um, it's a, been used as a grace and favour home for kind of royal staff and kind of distant relatives for many years. Um, and he'd rather hope that one of his children, particularly Princess Eugenie, might be able to move into it. She's, of course, in Frogmore Cottage at the moment, um, Harry and Meghan's home. But if they do plan to come back more to the UK, that is not going to be necessarily a satisfactory long-term option unless they decide to relinquish the cottage and let Eugenie have it permanently. Um, I, obviously the Cambridges would get priority if uh, they do want Adelaide Cottage uh, but it was quite interesting that uh, Andrew uh, I think seems to see his future very much at Windsor despite his withdrawal from public life and that he wants his family uh, close around him as well. Thank you Rebecca. Let's bring the panel back now. Richard, what did you make of this latest twist in it says here the game of homes. <laughs> I, I love these stories about properties, <laughs> don't you? Sort of who's going to get what home or whatever. It seems a bit strange because, you know, it's been made clear that Prince Andrew has no future role. Certainly as soon as Prince Charles becomes king, there's questions about his own home. So it would be quite unusual for his daughter to be given grace and favour property. Um, but I, I think it's... Well, she hasn't got herself into any trouble, though. The, the talk is... No, it's true. The talk is that this house, Adelaide Cottage, might go to the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge instead and i think being you know future king prince william has first refusal on properties um, but we've got his big move to berkshire coming his family so it makes sense for them to have a home and there are lots of security implications so i think basically if william and catherine want it they get it i don't understand why prince andrew's daughters feel this sense of entitlement that they must have a home on the royal estate princess margaret sister of the Queen, her two children, David Lindley and Sarah, um, have their own homes. They're not behind the protective wall of Kensington Palace. They've got homes in nice parts of London, no doubt. Uh, they're not, they don't have security, nor do Eugenie and Beatrice. But do you suspect the stomping feet of Andrew? I do. Yeah. I do. He, yeah. sa uh, he says, what about my children? He fought tooth and nail to stop them having security removed, which, ha was a p which happened to all minor royals. They are minor royals, those girls. They're princesses. They should never have been princesses, in my view. Uh, that they should, but that was, again, Andrew insisting, because he's very set this great sense of entitlement and status. But they should just be like all the other royals, buy their own home. They're both married money, after all. I do, I do find it very hard to imagine Princess Anne insisting that, um, yeah. you know, Peter Phillips or Zara Tyndall get a it's grace and favour home. It's very true when you put it that way. And I'm, what I'm interested in is how we can keep talking about Prince Charles's plans for a slimmed down monarchy if all these extended royals yeah, have, uh, have these grace and favour properties. How, how is this? It, it's got to stop, in yeah. my view. And you, uh, of course, William and Kate, because they're future king and queen. Uh, and, um, and and Harry, if Harry was a still a key part of the royal family, you could argue that too, because brother of the king. But the rest of them, get a life, get a job, get a house. Well, and they don't can, expect they can us to subsidise it, right? it. Yeah, of course they can. Yeah. But mm. it's, state, it's all about status, isn't it? Now, Richard, you're always sticking up for the princesses. Yeah. So what's your view? I'm keen to hear. Well, they, they need to live somewhere, don't they? Um, <laughs> we'll but, allow them that. But whether yeah. that needs to be a grace and favour property, I don't know. Um, but I suspect that in this case they won't, because if the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge want it, as I say, they, they will get it. Mm. Um, but can I make a suggestion? We read in the papers just a couple of weeks ago that Sarah Ferguson was paid £20,000 to give advice to a caravan part tycoon. There could be some nice caravans for the young princesses. Wow. What I mean, do you think? I, I hear they can Good be idea. very fancy these there days. There we are. <laughs> nice idea. Last time I slept in a caravan, I knocked a glass of water over myself in the middle of the night. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a different type of lodge to Royal Lodge, yeah. wouldn't it? You could put the caravan in Camber Sands. Lovely, view, lovely, view, lovely views. Oh. Very nice beach. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant... Let, let's run that up the flagpole to the palace. Richard, I want to just turn quickly to the Queen's extended absence and the message seems to be from the palace it's business as usual business as usual but now with the news today that there are significant garden parties that she won't be attending and other royals will be representing her it is not business as usual is it no it's not really i mean the queen will be so sad um, not to attend garden parties because i think she loved them and people who attend those they you know, it'd be the highlight of their their lives to yeah. go to one of these parties and the queen and prince philip they would make their way and talk to as many people as possible 
I mean, personally, I would love to have seen her. She could be in that sort of um, that buggy type thing that I they were talking about. I was just about, about to suggest that. Why, why can't she do that? Drive round, yeah. Is it just a point of pride? I, I think, I think it's a dignity yeah. question yeah. and um, not wanting to go to events if she doesn't feel up to it and no one wants to force her. And we fully understand that. So it's just a sign the times and all the other members of the royal family will happily join in and go to the, the, the garden parties and make them a great event for everyone there. But it does illustrate the fact that we have to assume now that the Queen won't attend events. And it's a story if she does. It's just giving me such a sense of foreboding. Do you think we'll see Her Majesty on the balcony? Again? I do. I think right. that's the one we will see because um, they can get her there quite discreetly cars and all the rest of it and uh, there'll be there's lifts in the palace i think that's the one thing we will see and that will be almost her, the crowning glory of her reign the only monarch to get to 70 years the only mon monarch to have a platinum jubilee there on the on the balcony and there'll be a huge crowd there to show their appreciation be interesting to see who's on the balcony with her maybe charles and camilla maybe william and kate that'll be it mm. very sad not to have prince philip there but i think i'd be astonished if she's not on that balcony. There's already mutterings that it may not happen at all. You know, mm. if they're not sure that the Queen feels up to it, they just won't have that balcony moment. But that would be a big thing for us. It'd we be become Prince so Andrew used to it. breaking in and muscling in. Yes, exactly. Here we are, Mum. <laughs> Let me help you on. Oh, my goodness. That is almost all we have time for today. My thanks to Rebecca English, Andrew Pearce, Richard Eden, and to you for watching always. This week, Princess Charlotte turned seven. Happy birthday to her. And the male's Claire Gisotti has spotted a remarkable similarity between her and her father, Prince William, as a child. We'll leave you with this gallery of very cute royal lookalikes. Goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.